African art started finding its way into Europe and North America in the 19th century, when um, the Europeans you know, took most of the African art as war booty or as object of curiosity. You know, we have missionaries in African countries converting people to Christianity and at the end of the day, taking their works to Europe as object of, uh, I don't know what to call it now, maybe as object to show that, oh, they've converted people and they have more Christians in African nations. But African art started, um, the real passion to collect African art started in the 1920s to 1930s when um, the Europeans started having much more interest in African art and there was a lot of exhibitions about African art during that period up until this moment. And now we have a market for African art in the West. I mean, African art has, the prices for African art has gone up. Take Sodibi, for example. But despite the celebration of African art in the West, it seems that black people are, I mean, it's, the, the West reaction to black people is a bit contradictory from the way they react to African art. And there's the case of George Floyd, who was killed by a police officer in, um, in May this year. And thankfully, the, the death of George Floyd inspired an international protest, mm. which I would say end the black virtual support from institutions or museums all over the world and other organizations in the world. But Floyd wasn't the first to die, I mean, due to police brutality. Neither was he the last to die. There was a case of Breonna Taylor in March this year, who was killed in her home by a police officer. And right after Floyd's death as well, um, Ray Shack Brooks was also killed in June in his car. Don't you think the West like um, African arts more than the people? I, I mean, don't you think there's, I don't know, I just feel, why would you love the arts so much and hate pe the people who are supposed to be the embodiment of this art? I mean, if you really love African art, you should like African people. Yeah. What do you think museums in this age can do to correct this notion? I think the protests that really emerged over the killing of George Floyd um, really kind of underlie the systemic racism that um, that I think it manifests itself in different ways in different countries. Um, yeah. And it affects different yeah. groups in different countries, um, depending on on who who those majority, uh, how the how the populations are. Are, are, are made up um, you know you can look at Germany Britain France and again you find systemic racism now but I think it yeah. sometimes takes different forms um, I think all those countries um, a lot of them are globalized countries now and um, so there's a place for everybody um, we need to get beyond this idea of the nation state and to my mind the real problem is this idea of nation state and of identity and that, that particular nation states have one particular history or one dominant history and one particular identity. That should no longer be true in the 21st century with so much, with so much movement of people. And also movement in terms of culture, movement uh, of arts. There's no place for that way of thinking. Um, unfortunately, I think you're right. I think what has happened is that if we look at the legal frameworks of um, a lot of Western countries, well, many countries in the world, um, it's a lot easier to allow art and cultural objects to travel than it is to allow people to travel. And I remember, you know, we've had exhibitions at MOA where our, our, our habit is to invite artists to the opening of our exhibitions. Sometimes 12, 13, 14 artists we will invite to the opening of an exhibition um, from different parts of the world. That's a lot. It's a lot. And, um, yeah. and what we have found now and then, particularly I remember when we did uh, an exhibition, Safar Voyage, um, was problem, which was on the art of Turkey, um, Iran, and North Africa, that it was 
it was really difficult sometimes to get people visas to come into Canada. So you're right. So on the one hand, we have this kind of parallel system where culture and objects travel yeah. and people, act, there are all kinds of impediments to people traveling. Yeah. And so there's a disjuncture. And this is really regrettable. I think we should all be working, working against that. I think museums yeah. should take a lot more of an active role in, um, in, in, in working, not only working, but also organizing. I think now, after what has happened with George Floyd and, um, and the continuing um, police brutality and the racism which certain political parties and individuals in the world yeah. have provided a way for that to surface and manifest itself, we all need to become activists. Museums yeah. need to become activists. There's no excuse not to be an activist any longer. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. As um, during that period, I mean, I saw a lot of posts by museum virtual support. Oh, museum of so 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 supports the black in this in that. And I kept thinking, what more can we do to support yeah. people? I mean, it's okay to put it online to say you support people, yeah. but what are the active things you're doing to support them? Because these people are living in fear of what can happen next. Yeah. Who who is next to be killed by the police? You know, it's. I mean. We should all live in a world where we are free to live, where we are free to be who we are. It's not as if we chose our color I and mean, yeah. we were this way and yeah. we're proud yeah. to be. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I think the problem, you know, there's a problem also with globalization because I mean, I, I'm, I back globalization. I am a globalist. I believe in one world. But unfortunately, the way globalization has been applied is it's economic globalization more than yes. anything else. You're and right. what we need is true globalization, yeah, uh, and, which will allow people to move ideas, yeah, to and, move, which yeah. will allow us to be free. To be, and yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of think globalization is you know, more like one sophisticated nation, in quotes, trying to force its, I mean, its way of life onto other people. And so if these people are not taking this way of life, you see them as less and you just want to eradicate them completely, which yeah. is not supposed to be. I mean, if the world is going to be globalized, then Africans should be able to be Africans. Other people should be able to be themselves. Let everything mix together. And we all live in, in a unified world, right? Well, yeah. yeah. I really don't know. Yeah, and that's the richness, I think, of, um, of, of what humanity has to offer. Um, yeah. And I think it comes through in, in the art. I mean, for me, it's a peculiar thing to, it's a peculiar thing for me to imagine that people don't see the people, the sensibility, the artists, um, the imagination, the kind of cultural and religious ideas that inform African art, how can you not see that independent of the actual art piece? Or the, it, it's, it's something strange that's happening in people's minds, no? Yeah. And I think yeah. it probably comes from this idea of identity, the nation state, economic globalization, yeah. uh, he, um, and that needs to be corrected. It does. Yeah. And, and you're right. Museum have a, a whole lot to do because, I mean, we can, I feel many people come to the museum to view the works, to view the exhibitions. So we, museum should try more to make these um, positions that people should be allowed to be. I mean, Africans are humans too. Yeah. 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 And also, I think, you know, that also goes to looking at um, who are, who are the so-called experts? Um, and again, you know, from the perspective of British Columbia, um, looking at the work we do with First Nations, I think there's a parallel with Africa and with all peoples in the world. Um, the work we do with First Nations is we look, we look to those communities, to those knowledge holders, to provide the voice of interpretation rather than impose our own voices on, on, on that. Yeah. And what we have at present is, like with First Nation peoples, we have a lot of material co uh, collections which are in certain parts of the world that are divorced from the majority 
of the people who made all them. these people yeah that, made, again, that actually um anthony sorry for cutting no. you i yeah i i kind of want to ask a question in that line as well because you know with my experience in british columbia since i got here for the past one year and i've had um, discussions with more curators i have uh, no come to understand that more work closely with the um, indigenous communities in Canada, which I think is very much, very, very interesting. So I was wondering, that, does MOA also repatriate objects, I mean, material objects to material culture to these communities? And there, there was a recent call up on Twitter by Dan X about the Benin bronzes in, in MOA collection. So I was wondering if you can say something about that. Yeah, yeah. So I think repatriation is really important. It's a way of building relationships and um, restoring relationships. In fact, it's a form of restorative justice. But I think you've got to look at repatriation in terms of lots of other relationships. And I think sometimes the mistake we make is to look at repatriation in isolation of all the other relationships between museums and communities and individuals. So I would kind of say we need to take a much wider perspective um, on on, on, on repatriation. So what I mean by that is, I mean, we work with communities um, up and down the coast. Um, we do repatriate objects. There are criteria for repatriation. Um, there are processes for repatriation. But, um, you know, some museums are afraid that if they start repatriation, then everything goes back and they lose their entire collections. Then it's it not becomes true. empty, right? <laughs> yeah, it's not true, yeah. though. Um, and I think th works move in both directions. They come into the collections, and why shouldn't they go out of the collections? Yeah. Um, they move back and forth. And I'm thinking that in the last five years, we have had two um, First Nation families who have chosen to give very important collections of um, regalia um, to the museum because they feel that we, we respect the material, they look at the protocols by which we, by which we um, care for material, the restrictions regarding who we show it to, who we don't show it to. That's awesome. um, so there, the, the, the feeling is that we can work together. And I think that's really, really, important. Um, I remember when I worked at the British Museum, now the British Museum often says it doesn't repatriate objects, but it does repatriate objects. Oh, really? It does it very quietly. Um, <laughs> um, because I think, or when I worked there, um, the reason was they were afraid, this is 30 years ago, they were afraid of, um, you know, losing huge numbers of the collections. But for example, when I was there, they repatriated, um, some really important, uh, uh, an important royal collection um, to Madagascar. And that was part of a big exhibition they did on Madagascar. That was in the 19, 1980s. So there is a quiet repatriation that happens. Um, but we need to see repatriation in relationship to all those other human, 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 human relations. Yeah. I mean, we repatriate, for example, um, we might repatriate, um, I'm thinking the repatriation of the Gaps Collets poll, um, which went from the National Museum of Sweden in Stockholm and was returned to Kitimat. And um, it wasn't only a movement of the poll from Sweden, uh, from Stockholm to, um, to Kitimat, um, but artists went over to Stockholm to carve a copy of that poll. Um, wow. What came out of that was school programs, or the twinning of schools between the two between the two countries, and so all kinds of emergence. It's not just only about objects. Objects objects can bring people can separate people over yeah. ownership. Mm -hmm. They can also bring people together, and I think that's one really great example of um, of how of how we need to look at repatriation in terms of relationships, um, and we need to be open to it. Yeah, that's the. Benin, you mentioned the Benin bronzers in, yeah. in our collection. So my understanding is, um, and uh, my understanding is that um, the bronzers that we have um, 
are all we're all bought on the market. They were all made for the market. I think most of them date to the 1970s, um, 1980s. Um, a lot of um, so, to the best of my knowledge, they're commercially produced bronzers. Okay. I think we have one bell, which looks like it might be 19th century. Um, and what I would say is um, we should probably do research on that bell if we get um, uh, a formal, um, uh, uh, if, if, if we're asked to return that, we would do the research. And if it had come out illegally, um, we would return it. But I think um, most of the bronzes are commercially, are commercially made in our collection. Well, that's, I mean, that's great. I mean, I, I wish all uh, museum uh, directors can think like you to repatriate objects that are needed to be repatriated. You know, the Benin bronzes, for example, I mean, there are a lot of them in the British Museum and other museums, you know, in the West. And yeah. hopefully they, they will take you from Moa and maybe repatriate some of these objects. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I would say that, you know, Dan Hicks works for the Pitt Rivers Museum that themselves have a very important collection of historical Benin bronzes. Okay. Um, Titilope, um, I wanted to um, ask you about your experiences um, here in Canada. You've been with us nearly a year no yeah and, and <laughs> just two months above a year yeah 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 and um you're in the art history department um and um working um on 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 a thesis on, on a dissertation um looking at african african art and african museums and comparing museums in senegal to um nigeria which i think is a uh, really interesting because um there's not a lot of work done on on, on in that d detail on African museums. Yeah. Um, how have you found, how has your experience of, of, of Canada been? Um, how, uh, I think it's the first time you've, you, you, you visited us now. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's the first time I visited anywhere outside of my country. <laughs> yeah, so um, my experience in Canada has, I mean, has been mixed kind of. It's been challenging and at the same time interesting. I mean, um, I was first hit by cultural shock. I mean, I didn't know I was going to experience that. When Catherine was asking me, oh, Titi Lokbe, how have you found Canada? I mean, have you adjusted? I was like, I'm fine, I'm okay. It wasn't until later that it hit me that, oh my God, I miss home. How am I going to survive in this place all by myself alone? But yeah. Thankfully, I was able to overcome this culture shock, thanks to you. I mean, wonderful people like you, Ademoa, and you know, faculty members at the art, art, uh, history department of UBC. It's been, it's been a lot of experience, but interesting ones, I'll tell you. And also working on, um, as a member of the director's advisory board, board at the MOA, and you know, Co-curating the African exhibition has been new dimensions of learning for me as well. Like, I'm much more excited about the exhibition, though, you know, because I, I, I feel this exhibition is going to create more visibility for Blacks in Vancouver and diasporic Africans who are in Vancouver. And in my own word, I think it's a subtle way of fighting racism. You know, there's this system, systemized racism that people said they experienced. I haven't experienced it, but I've had a lot of people who said, oh, some people are being, you know, harsh to them, they are being bad to them, maybe because of their color or something. So I feel um, creating more visibility for the Black in this um, Vancouver community, for example, will help fight racism, and I'm much more excited about that. Mm -hmm. So you, you've been working on the exhibition right from the start when um, it was a very different kind of exhibition. Yes, it was a different kind. And um, coming to Vancouver, I, I am introduced to a new experience from where I come from. I mean, over there, we're all Blacks. So uh, I don't have to start thinking of, 
oh my identity or something i just assume that everyone knows me everyone know where i'm from but here being black in vancouver you meet different people from different culture i mean we have people from asia we have people from india yeah. we have people from different parts of the world and you're like, oh okay yeah so you i'm in a place where i have to consistently show people who i really am a lot of people ask oh you're black you're from africa where are you from in africa i have to tell them or oh, what's nigeria like i'm okay so i know i'm in a new environment i i am black i am nigerian first so my identity is very very important and so i have come to appreciate my being black more i mean on getting to canada because i feel oh we, there are a lot of things we take for granted when you are home, you are with your people, but when you are far away from home, you realize that there's nowhere like home, first mm. and foremost, and wherever you are, you need to make that place a home, but then you need to consistently look back to be able to make your new environment a home. So yeah, yeah. that has been my experience. And I think that's one of the richnesses of Canada in particular, is that there are people from all over the world and um, and I think one of the things I hope museums help to do is to give people the confidence to actually be themselves, to express yeah. their own cultures, their own identities, because that way we don't have one particular view of the world. We have many views of the world, and we kind of, you know, we, 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 we can ad- we all kind of gain from that because we can adapt to the world and we can appreciate its multifaceted richness and diversity and beauty and different ways of seeing that. I mean, mean, there's, there's something we say in Nigeria, uh, we say there's beauty in diversity. You know, Nigeria is in itself multicultural. We have different ethnic groups that make Nigeria itself. Well, we are all black. We only have different beliefs, different languages. So there's this thing we say about um, beauty in diversity. But I think I I come to um, appreciate that more getting here because so I could see see the diverseness of people themselves and then the culture. So I'm like, oh, yeah, this is what they mean when they say there's beauty in diversity. I mean, you see five people. And then one is white, one is from Asia, one is, you know, you see different people and you're like, oh God, this yeah. is what they mean by beauty in diversity. Yeah, it's, it's been a whole lot of experience, but I won't lie to you, I enjoyed it, every bit yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the exhibition that you're working on, we started off, you no, know, um, really seeing that as an exhibition, which was going to be a series of conversations, the conversations yes. between Nigerian artists, which um, yes, you were yeah. working on, um, conversations which would include um, people from our local community, from uh, the local um, Caribbean and African um, Canadian communities, um, and also a dialogue with objects in our collection, because there are collections of African art across Canada. I think there are probably about eight or nine, but we don't know them very well. They've not often been exhibited and I believe um, there isn't the same richness in those collections that you find in the US or, um, or in Europe, but they're still important for people, I think. Um, you know, people from different parts of Africa and the Caribbean coming to Canada. And from my experience working in London, um, the museum's providing cultural objects that those people can take their children to see. Yeah and to feel that you know that they're given they're given importance they're given respect and um they're part of that 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 legacy that those families can pass down to their children i think that's really important but we've changed all that now i mean overnight almost with the um um with the um uh with the issues around um george floyd and you know what happened from that we decided we've got to stop this this is kind of um what we now need to do in this moment in history um this is not the time to do the kind of exhibition that we plan and what we need to do is provide a platform to you and others from the local community um to actually 
to to use in order to um, in order to provide your voice. I mean, what's required at this time is not our voices. It's your voices yeah. and community voices. Could you just say something about your experience? Um, oh yes, um, my ex experience about the exhibition in total. I mean, going back and forth, changing things, changing. It's been interesting yeah it's been interesting but what what i i will say about that is the exhibition we're working on now i mean the team we're working on it's still related to what we had planned and so and i must commend you for that i mean it's as if you you saw right into the future and then you brought up something that that's going to remain relevant even in this present time so what we're working now um working on now is to look, see how Africans and you know, Black Canadians are, are looking back to tell present story and hopefully to also tell future stories. Mm -hmm. And um, in bringing together um, artworks from Nigeria, from Lagos in particular, and then from other artists here in Vancouver, we have realized that this uh, exhibition we're working on is still very much related to the conversation we had initially. And so what we're doing basically is to still juxtapose this um, MOA collection with works from Lagos and work from Vancouver. And we are going to give the, um, the audience because um, the power of this exhibition lies basically with the audience that are coming to view this exhibition. So we are not coming to tell them, you know, there's a way you make people see certain things and what you're doing is you're pushing your opinion on them. So we're going to, I mean, allow them to come view this exhibition and then go out with the stories they want to go out with. So we are laying it all bare to them that, oh, yeah, this is Africa now. This was Africa in the past and this is the conversation between Africa now and Africa in the past. So we are bringing works that that, that have relationship with um, the MOA object to show that, yes, Africa has evolved the, the way the old world has. Well, I, I mean, if you are African, you were born in Africa, you, you lived in Africa, you're a part of this culture. So whatever you're still doing now, is not far removed from what has been. And I, I can say the same for um, Black Canadians as well. I mean, they've been here, they were born here, this is their roots. But then they have affiliation with African and some of these traces can still be seen in their works. And yeah, and so we, we are also using the opportunity to, to, to make known that Black community have been here for a very long time, right? And mm -hmm. there's the Oganali and other, the black community in Vancouver. So, so this is a period where we can, you know, bring a, a larger people, maybe people from even outside um, Vancouver to see that, yes, there are black people here mm -hmm. and there are African people here. So they've been here and will continue to be here. So it, it's just a way to create more visibility for the black, basically. And at the same time, address the issue of police brutality, mm -hmm. racism, and you know, all this thing about color and all of that. I mean, we are all humans, right? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. that's what we're trying to do, basically. But it's still ongoing because we're still working. More ideas might still come in, but yeah. That's yeah. what we're working on right now. Yeah, yeah. So we've talked a little bit about Canada. And we've talked through the exhibition about how one Canadian institution is trying to engage with Nigeria in this case. And yes, and at the same so. time, it's yes. Canada. So it's interesting. But could you say something now perhaps about Nigeria? And um, you were a member of faculty at the University of Lagos. Um, yes. You're an artist yourself. You're an activist. You've been working on literacy um, programs in Nigeria before you came here. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of excitement um, recently about contemporary African art, and rightly so. Um, could you say something about the art world in Nigeria or Lagos? Okay, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> being an artist from Lagos and 
are not educated myself because I mean, I, I lectured at the University of Lagos for a while before coming here for my PhD. So I would say, um, as in Nigeria is, <laughs> I don't know how to put it. I think artists in Nigeria are consistently looking for identity themselves. Okay, um, and I'm going to paint a scenario here uh, using myself as an example. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we had this colonial past of the British coming to Nigeria to colonize us, um, creating schools in Nigeria, and they were teaching us what they want us to learn because, I don't know, as far as they are concerned, probably we are barbaric and we are not well civilized. So they wanted to teach us their civilization and yeah, they were initially we were dropping our culture, you know, there's Christianity, there was Islam too that was introduced and you know, so people were dropping their culture to take in this new culture. So I think right now people have gotten to that level where they, they're like, Oh, you know, I'm tired of being told what to do. I need to find my own voice. I need to go back to where wherever I came from and then maybe combine it with where I am right now to be able to have my own voice. And I think galleries in Nigeria too, uh, I mean, they are really helping artists in that way because they encourage artists to, to have their own voice. So we go to school, our art schools needs to be reviewed because most of the things, the stick teachers in the art school are the laid down rules. I mean, by the British, they just teach you how to draw, teach you how to do live drawing and all of that. But what I, understand is artists after getting out of school i mean after getting their degree they then decide to go wherever way they want to go and so and what most of them are doing now is they're kind of looking back to write present story i mean examples of this can be found in the works of the likes of victor e camino onosoya onolaja peju laiwola Latishi, then there's Onome, Olotu, there's Jalili Atiku. I mean, we have a lot of them. Bruce Onobrapea, Jotunpopo, we have a lot of contemporary artists in Nigeria who, who are at the forefront now. And you know, um, also, I, well, I knew this before I came here and I come to understand it more on getting to Canada that people over here do not really know so much about contemporary Nigerian art. So when they hear African art, they think of masks, they think of, you know, all those um, ethnographic objects, but there a lot have changed. I mean, there, there are so much more happening in Africa now. I mean, there are a lot of um, political issues that artists are addressing in the present moment. And when you look at their work, you see, you see traces of the past in their work, but that does not reduce it from being authentic because they are also combining present um, materials and they are addressing present issues. So we have galleries in Nigeria and uh, yeah, there's this yearly art text that for every year that support contemporary art in Nigeria. And there was a Lagos Biennia that was inaugurated in 2017, created by Fola Kunli Oshun. So all these bodies are beginning to come up to help contemporary artists in Nigeria. Um, there's um, another gallery, Relay Arts Gallery in Lagos as well, that encourages contemporary art. And, and so, uh, I mean, uh, we have a lot of young artists and they are all coming out to lend their voices. Uh, we also have artists dealing with um, issues of feminism in Africa, like Ayobola Kekewe Okun Onola Jaonosoya that I mentioned earlier is working in line with bringing, um, interpreting old uh, women, Nigerian women in history, such as Moromi, Oshun, Oyo, and then representing them as contemporary women. So to tell the story that, yes, we've always had strong women in Nigeria. We still have strong women in Nigeria. And yeah, so I feel contemporary art is really evolving. And like I said, people are consistently looking for identity. So they are in search of identity. They, everyone wants to have a voice. We're in this era of freedom of speech, freedom of everything. And so we want to be free to lend our voices. And 
At present, there's a lot of um, new museums that are, and galleries that are opening in Africa. Um, last year, I think the Museum of Africa opened in Senegal, in Dakar. Um, there's been uh, a new museum in Kenya and also galleries in, um, in South Africa. So would you say, do you see um, Africa as going through a renaissance uh, in terms of um, uh, in terms of museum buildings and um, investing more in museums? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> in Africa, we have new museums coming up, which I think are interesting. But I also feel we also have old museums in Africa, right? Mm -hmm. That can be, I mean, renewed, maybe if the government will start putting more fund into this museum, and then they get renovated and they have new curators and train their old stars and all of that. That can as well work. But yeah, there's you know, there's a new museum in Senegal as well as South Africa that are really, really concerned about contemporary issues and the issue of decolonization, which I think are interesting. Yeah, so I think African museums. And another issue that I think African museums have is because they they are not um, they've not really been documented. I mean, there there's a lot of writings about African art history, um, mm -hmm. history of you know some of these writing even generalized African art. But some some authors have taken their time to go into different communities in Africa to write about the people how they started, I mean, so we have the like of Henry Drua who wrote uh, extensively about the Yoruba people, right? But then there are no writings, significant writings about museums in Africa. Mm -hmm. Because yes, we do have museums in Africa, but these museums are facing a whole lot of challenges that no one is documenting, no one is looking into. So I think the first way to up Africa to you know grow more in terms of museum because like I said in Lagos for instance artists are looking more into galleries. Mm. I mean, no one is really thinking of the museums because they believe maybe the museum is maybe the old or dead or you know all those bad times and it's not supposed to be. So I feel uh, there are a lot we can do for African museum, but the first will be to write about them. Yeah. to create visibility for this museum to to let the world know that they exist in the first place and they are still running and another will be to fund them i mean every museum need fund yeah. to function well and i know this lies more with uh, this lies more with the government but individuals can help as well mm -hmm. in doing that and i do believe we need to emphasize repatriation yeah. Because yeah. African arts need to, I mean, the, the core ones need to go back to Africa yeah. and to be in this museum. So when people go to Africa, they have a lot to look at in African museums. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I was going to ask you, Anthony, um, about the um, objects at the MOA. You know, I, I know MOA have um, ethnographic objects from different parts of the world in the museum. So I was kind of wondering, do these um, owner cultures have a say in how these objects are displayed in the museum? Mm -hmm. And also, um, the um, employment of, you know, museum staff and all, what informed the employment of museum staff at the MOA? Who gets to see the work advertisement? Is it only for Canadians or do people all over the world get to see this advert of mm, mm. maybe museum curators, for instance? And you as a museum director, um, I mean, you're working in the museum as a director. So what do you think, what is your vision for museum in this, I mean, polarized world? Well, MOA has kind of um, made its history and its identity on working with communities, working directly with communities um right from the 1980s and some would say before that since our foundation um but certainly from the 1980s we built very close relationships with um uh 
First Nation peoples up and down the coast, and we continue to work with them and build those relationships. I think they're becoming stronger. Um, all, our ex all, all, all our exhibitions um, on Northwest Coast Art, of which is one of our foci, um, always involve, um, involve co-curators co brought from those communities. Um, we also have um, really close relationships with, uh, with the Pacific and um, we have memos of understanding with the Papua New Guinea, the National Museum of Papua New Guinea, with the Solomon Islands Museum, um, Fiji. And again, we've had some long-term uh, long research projects and collecting projects. Um, in the Sepik River, for example, and in other parts of um, the Pacific. And we've done those with artists and wow. with museums in those countries. Um, in Africa, we've started to make some of those relationships. But as you know, until recently, um, we did, we've not had a curator uh, for the African collections. And in fact, only two museums in the whole of Canada have African curators. Um, so there's a lot more we can do there. Um, in Latin America, uh, again, we've worked with, um, we've worked with um, artists, we've worked with communities, we've worked with, them, uh, with, 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 with governments and museums. Um, we've done a number of exhibitions. In fact, one of the trends we've been trying to push is that we should have bilingual exhibitions because um, we, Canada calls itself a multicultural country. But cultural multiculturalism is kind of easy. Um, if you want to really deepen that, you need linguistic uh, multiculturalism. And you need to introduce languages. And so, you know, yeah. we've been introducing um, Chinese and um, uh, Portuguese, Spanish, um, different uh, First Nation indigenous languages into the exhibitions. We've got different strategies, sometimes uh, bilingual, sometimes we come in and out of different languages. We, 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 we swap um, and hopefully yeah. the meaning of some of the, um, the, uh, the indigenous phrases uh, you can glean from the context. Of, uh, yeah, uh, I kind of think the ongoing exhibition at the MOA now, the, um, um, the exhibition about uh, Kenk Monkma. Yeah is doing the bilingual thing because you know when i got to the museum i saw french i saw the indigenous language and i saw english i'm like oh this is interesting yeah, 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 but yeah. it would be much more interesting if you can have sound you know and you yeah. have to listen to the french then you listen to the english as well as the indigenous language yeah the text panels are in cree for that one yeah. and i think that's really important i also think it's really important that museums make that commitment you know, surely the strength of Canada, I mean, what distinguishes it from my way of thinking from the United States is having at least two official languages and the ability yeah. to think in those two languages because it mm -hmm. frees the mind. You make kind of associations that you don't make in one, one language. And so linguistic diversity is really important. And it makes me also think of Africa because we've been talking a lot about the visual arts and sculpture and contemporary art. But Nigeria in particular now has an incredibly rich tradition of literature, yeah. um, uh, contemporary and modern literature, um, of filmmaking, uh, yeah. of media. And in a way, our institutions need to be multisensorial. Um, not only do we need to embrace different languages, but we need to bring in um, other media that depend on different senses. Yes, yeah, so media, <laughs> media different from maybe ethnographic objects. Yeah. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. It's got to, I mean, most of the exhibitions that we do, we, we moved away from this idea of anthropology, well, the idea of anthropology as a disciplinary subject, um, which I think in the 1970s probably more or less had a monopoly over culture. Um, we've moved away from that idea. So our exhibitions really look at culture and anthropology no longer has a monopoly over culture. No, you've got um, the new art history, cultural history, intellectual history, critical theory, women's studies, critical indigenous studies, they all, cultural geography, they all have something to say about yeah. 
the human condition and political social situations in the world. So we try, we've tried to actually position, reposition ourselves, although we called a museum yeah. of anthropology. Yeah, you, you know, that's actually a, a, a very interesting thing, really, because I was reading one article sometimes earlier this year, I can't remember the name now, and it say, oh, describing museum as a place where work go to to die. And I'm yeah. like, Museum is supposed to be a place where work, live, you know, continue to live. I mean, when you take a, an object to the museum, it's to preserve them, right? To make to make sure this work continue to live. So when if individuals, I mean, I mean, contemporary people start thinking of museum as where objects go to die, then museum are in a way losing their um, values, and you know, people will start looking elsewhere instead of the museum. So I think yeah, it's. What you're doing with Moa is really interesting. Yeah. Really, really interesting. Yeah. And lending I, voices to contemporary artists and letting them come in to have a voice because so what are the history we're going to read about tomorrow? Is what histories are, are we going to read about tomorrow? They are the histories we make today, right? So we should start letting them have a voice too in the museum. And they're multiple histories, they're not singular histories. And I think that goes back to the second part of your question in terms of what is MOA doing to, um, to bring in people from outside of Canada? How can we be more embracing? Well, we have seven curatorships here. And wow. you know, there's an argument that you look at, um, you look at curate, uh, directors of museums in Canada and there's not a lot of diversity there. And we as directors, we're aware of that. I mean, we've, um, and we're trying to address it in, 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 in different ways. Mm -hmm. But there are many, many more curators than there are directors. And I think the real problem, well, the problem is, of course, you've got to, you've got to diversify the directors, um, yeah. but you've also got to diversify curators. And, um, you know, even those curators who talk the loudest about um, decolonization, um, our work with institutions that are not diverse and I think we really need a kind of a radical change of a change of mind in terms of um, how we represent the world and how we really diversify um, we've introduced ling la language requirements so for example for all our curatorial positions for the last um, three or four years we've required people to speak at least um, one and possibly two languages yes, from the so region so. that they have responsibility for. Oh, and that's right. starting to have an effect in terms of diversifying um, the curators okay. that we get. But we have a long way to go. Museums have a long way to go. Oh, interesting. So nice yes. having a chat with you, really. Yeah, it's been brilliant talking with you, Titilope. Um, and um, no, thank you for sharing your views and for challenging me because I think that's the most important thing. <laughs> oh, we really? all need to be challenged constantly to rethink how we do things. Yeah, and, thank you too uh, for answering my questions. I mean. No, I've thank you. <laughs>